Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Tuesday, June 22nd, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. How a single-celled yellow slime is changing the way scientists think about intelligence. A new upcycled food label that would let you know when your food has been made with food scraps that would have otherwise gone to waste. And everything you need to know about this week's Strawberry Supermoon. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Meet Physarum polycephalum, a shockingly yellow slime mold species that's been around mostly unchanged for a billion years. Typically found in forest environments, the single-celled slime aids in the decaying of organic matter. It's also capable of solving complex puzzles. Quoting Science Alert, Physarum polycephalum, adorably nicknamed the blob by biologist Audrey Ducator, isn't exactly rare. It can be found in dark, humid, cool environments like the leaf litter on a forest floor. It's also really peculiar. Although we call it a mold, it's not actually fungus, nor is it animal or plant, but a member of the protist kingdom, a sort of catch-all group for anything that can't be neatly categorized in the other three kingdoms. It starts its life as many individual cells, each with a single nucleus. Then they merge to form the plasmodium, the vegetative life stage in which the organism feeds and grows. In this form, fanning out in veins to search for food and explore its environment, it's still a single cell but containing millions or even billions of nuclei swimming in the cytoplasmic fluid confined within the bright yellow membrane." End quote. Physarum polycephalum has been studied for decades and used to be a popular choice for studying cell biology. Then it fell out of favor for a while and only recently came back, but not as a specimen for cell biology, rather as the subject of experiments on the slime's capabilities. Like other organisms, Physarum polycephalum needs to be able to navigate its environment to find safety and food, but this yellow slime takes it further. It's been found capable of solving labyrinth mazes, remembering substances it likes and doesn't like. Quaker oats, good. A growth medium used on mammal cells, yuck. And it even aced the traveling salesman problem, a complex mathematical task that programmers use to test algorithms. How is it doing all this without a brain? Well, as mycologist Ann Pringle pointed out to Wired, you have to think about it differently than how we would think of solving those puzzles. Physarum polycephalum achieves these tasks with remarkable efficiency, but it's not like it goes through the maze from point A to point B. Rather, it grows out over the whole maze and then retracts its body to the shortest path. Quoting again from Science Alert, Although it's technically a single-celled organism, Physarum polycephalum is considered a network, exhibiting collective behavior. Each part of the slime mold is operating independently and sharing information with its neighboring sections with no centralized processing. I guess the analogy would be neurons in a brain, says biologist Chris Reed of Macquarie University. You have this one brain that's composed of lots of neurons. It's the same for the slime mold. And that brain analogy is a really intriguing one, and it wouldn't be the first time Physarum polycephalum has been compared to a network of neurons. The topology and structure of brain networks and slime mold blobs are very similar, and both systems exhibit oscillations. It's not entirely clear how information is propagated and shared in the slime mold, but we do know that Physarum polycephalum's veins contract to act as a peristaltic pump, pushing cytoplasmic fluid from section to section. And oscillations in this fluid seem to coincide with encounters with external stimuli. It's thought that these oscillations convey information, process information by the way they interact and actually produce the behavior at the same time. Physicist Hans Gunther Doberiner of the University of Bremen tells Science Alert, end quote. Dubereiner and his colleagues published a paper in January showing how these oscillations are very similar to the ones seen in our brains. And if you want to see the slime's oscillations in action, I put a video in the show notes with tons of different examples in it. But those oscillations don't make the slime a brain. It's just another similarity. As far as scientists have been able to ascertain, the slime isn't capable of higher-level processing or abstract reasoning, Science Alert says. And seeing as it's been unchanged for about a billion years, it doesn't seem to have an interest in in evolving to do so. But it does leave us reevaluating how we define cognition. Reed told Science Alert, quote, 
We're talking about cognition without a brain, obviously, but also without any neurons at all. So the underlying mechanisms, the whole architectural framework of how it deals with information is totally different to the way your brain works. By providing it with the same problem-solving challenges that we've traditionally given to animals with brains, we can start to see how this fundamentally different system might arrive at the same outcome. It's where it becomes clear that for a lot of these things that we've always thought required a brain or some kind of higher information processing system, that's not always necessary. It's teaching us about the nature of intelligence, really, challenging certain views and basically widening the concept. It does force us to challenge these long-held anthropocentric beliefs that we are unique and capable of so much more than other creatures. End quote. Over a third of all food around the world will be lost or wasted somewhere between its origin at the farm or ranch and your garbage can this year. That's a loss of about $1 trillion globally. But maybe a new upcycling certification label will help change that. Like labels for fair trade certified or plastics made out of recycled materials, the upcycled certification would be stamped on certain foods created by food that would have otherwise gone lost. And similar to all of the ugly produce subscription programs, upcycling food is aimed at reducing waste. While it might sound just a little off at first, economists writing in the conversation point out that upcycling food is anything but new. And not just in creative leftovers and bone broth, but how about sausage made from meat scraps or jams made from overripe fruit? There's also plenty of startups now focused on creating new upcycled products. What is new now is the label, which comes from the Upcycled Food Association and is defined as food that, quote, uses ingredients that otherwise would not have gone to human consumption, are procured and produced using verifiable supply chains, and have a positive impact on the environment, end quote. And this new label may encourage more of the practice. More companies may get creative with upcycling on various products, and using the new term will hopefully get consumers on board as well. And it is already happening. There are over 400 upcycled products out there already, including, generally, quoting economist Rodney Holcomb and food engineer Danielle Belmer in the conversation, Fruit pomace, all the fibrous bits left after fruit juice production, bolsters the flavor and nutritional content of snack foods. Wheat middlings, everything left after milling that's not flour, are added to breakfast cereals to increase the content of vitamins, minerals, and fiber. Whey protein from cheese production increases the protein content of health bars and protein shakes. There's flour made from the pulp byproducts of soybean and almond milk production, which is sold as baking mixes or upcycled flours. There's craft beer that uses surplus unsold bread as the fermentation substrate. One group collects and distributes second-tier produce before it goes bad. Other examples include pecan shell flour, dried vegetable peels as soup ingredients, and powders made from waste fruits and vegetables that can be added to beverages and snack bars, end quote. And plenty of new products are being dreamt up and tested all the time, and with the new label, which studies have shown resonates well across generations, hopefully we'll see a lot more coming to market, because the scourge of food waste is all too real, and it's not just an economic thing. It's a food distribution issue and a climate issue. Quoting again from the conversation, the FAO estimates that about 8% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions can be traced to the carbon footprint of food loss and waste. Landfills generate greenhouse gas emissions, and recent U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimates indicate food waste is the single largest contributor to landfill volume, making up more than a fifth of what ends up at the dump. In addition, when food is wasted, all of the natural resources used to produce the food, including water, energy, and land resources, are wasted. End quote. Bertha Jimenez, the co-founder of Rise, a company that collects nutritious scraps to make flour, told CBS News, quote, all these things, it's been declared a waste because the way we treat it. But if we just changed the supply of how we take it, how we transport it, how we store it, it shouldn't be a waste. It should be an ingredient. It should be food. It should be whatever you want to make with them. But it shouldn't go to the landfill. End quote. The last supermoon of the year is coming this week, so mark your calendars for Thursday the 24th through Saturday the 26th if you want to catch a glimpse of the strawberry moon. 
The June full moon is traditionally called the strawberry moon in North America because in certain parts, June is when strawberries are in season, which just feels like salt in the wound for my strawberry plant, which started the season strong and has already fizzled out. The Strawberry Moon name, according to the Old Farmer's Almanac, comes from the Algonquin, Ojibwe, Dakota, and Lakota peoples, among others, but it's also been called other names by other indigenous nations and cultures to mark different plants being in season at this time. Like the Cherokee, who call it Green Corn Moon, or the Anishinaabe, who call it Blooming Moon, in honor of the flowers in bloom. The Cree call it Egg Laying Moon, or Hatching Moon. And hopping over the ocean to Europe, over there, the June moon was sometimes called the Mead moon, or the Honey moon. And given that June was once the traditional month for marriages, thanks to the Roman goddess of marriage Juno, Old Farmer's Almanac and NASA both speculate that it could be an origin of the term honeymoon, which entered usage around the 1500s in Europe. June is also a time of showing love in some Hindu traditions, quoting NASA. This full moon corresponds with Vat Purnima. During the three days of this full moon, married women will show their love for their husbands by tying a ceremonial thread around a banyan tree, end quote. NASA also adds that they sometimes call it the LRO moon, in honor of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which launched on June 18th, 2009, and is still up above us orbiting the moon. So, many different names, but the important thing to know is that it's called a strawberry moon because strawberries are in season in some places, not because the moon will be reddish pink in hue, or at least not completely. Quoting again from NASA, The orbit of the moon around the Earth is almost in the same plane as the orbit of the Earth around the sun, only about five degrees off. On the summer solstice, the sun appears highest in the sky for the year. Full moons are opposite the sun, so a full moon near the summer solstice will be low in the sky. Particularly for Europe's higher latitudes, when the full moon is low, it shines through more atmosphere, making it more likely to have a reddish color, for the same reasons that sunrises and sunsets are red. For the Washington, D.C. area, on the morning of June 25th, 2021, the full moon will reach its highest for the night at 1.39 a.m., only 24.6 degrees above the southern horizon, the lowest full moon moon of the year, end quote. It will also be, as I said, a supermoon, the last supermoon of 2021, and in case you missed all the hubbub around the pink supermoon in April, a supermoon is, quoting Lifehacker, sort of a faux scientific term meant to gin up a certain amount of anticipation, but it technically only occurs when a moon is within 90% of perigee, which is the closest point to Earth within an orbit. Supermoons are a little brighter and bigger than normal moons, end quote. A previous Lifehacker article notes that the term was coined by astrologer Richard Knoll. Yes, astrologer, not astronomer. So it's already not quite a scientific distinction. And the exact definition can vary. The Old Farmer's Almanac actually does not consider the strawberry moon this year to be a supermoon. Quoting them, At the Almanac, we define a full moon as being a supermoon if it is less than 224,000 miles away from Earth. June's full moon stands at 224,600 62 miles away, just barely outside that cutoff point. So, by that technical definition, we do not consider June's full moon to be a supermoon. However, given that it's only a couple thousand miles farther away than April and May's supermoons, viewers won't observe a perceptible difference. The full moon will still appear big and bright this month as long as we enjoy dark, clear night skies. End quote. The best viewing night will probably be Thursday, but it'll still be shining bright on Friday and Saturday, and if you want to figure out the best Best time to see it for you, you can input your location into the Old Farmer's Almanac's Moonrise and Moonset calculator linked in the show notes. So Chuck Tingle, author of the infamous Pounded in the Butt by My Own Butt and its numerous meta-sequels, as well as his trans-positive Harry Potter satire series and the phenomenal My Macaroni and Cheese is a Lesbian and Also She is My Lawyer, is back with his latest masterpiece, a choose-your-own-adventure Dungeons and Dragons-style fantasy novel. It's called, fittingly, Dungeons, Dragons, and Buckaroos, a Select-Your-Own-Timeline-Adventure. 
Unlike some of Tingle's surreal erotica, this book is fairly safe for work, and it's not his first select-your-own-timeline adventure. He previously published others, including Escape from the Billings Mall and Highway to Heck, but a D&D theme is sure to go down pretty well. It's set in Billings, Montana, and features a sentient 20-sided die, a unicorn necromancer, and dragon-guarded caverns of chocolate milk. Whether or not you read this particular book by Chuck Tingle, I do have to recommend at least going to read through his list of books. It is a near-endless Rolodex of wonder and amusement. But that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.